next on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. On this week's special edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll take a look at the role antibiotics are playing in today's beef cattle industry. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. Antibiotics, just one of the important tools in the role of modern beef production. This week, we'll take a look at our four-part series focusing on the role of antibiotics and brought to you by Bear Animal Health. Let's take a look. For cattle producing families in every corner of the country, job one is protecting the health of the animals for which they care for each and every day. I speak from my own personal experience when I say a cattleman are committed to using the tested tools in our toolbox to raise healthy animals while at the same time producing safe, wholesome, high quality and affordable beef for consumers. Today we begin a four part series looking at some of the key elements of cattle health and beef quality as well as some of the threats that could impact the ways in which producers care for their animals. This program is made possible through a grant from Bear Animal Health. Cattleman of the Cattleman reporter Dave Russell takes us to central Kansas to begin our series. We would want to be a part of the assurance of uh, being involved in the production of a safe and wholesome product uh, every day. And uh, we're committed to that every day and, and we take uh, a great deal of responsibility in making sure that we can deliver against that promise to the consumer. We love what we do and we care about what we do and we all have families and it's a family business and so um, this is our livelihood but we also want to bring the, the safest and best product to consumers. John Butler and Heather Donnelly work together in the Beef Marketing Group, or BMG, based in Great Bend, Kansas. BMG is a cattle marketing cooperative that consists of 14 feedlot operations in Kansas and Nebraska. Here, as at other feedlots across the country, the success of the business is literally dependent on the health of the cattle. Protocols that we have in place to keep cattle healthy are the feed yards work with their consulting veterinarian and they have a vaccination program. It's just like when you have to take your kids to get vaccinated before they start kindergarten. Same thing here is the cattle receive their vaccinations upon arrival to keep them healthy while they're here and then if they are treated um, because they're getting sick um, the cowboys have a animal health system that they use that everything's computerized that tells them how much product to give to the animal so we stay within um, label usage and then before cattle are shipped we have a, a protocol in place and that we have two people that actually have to print a re report from the animal health system to make sure that the cattle are clear. It's verified by two people um, every time and signed off and then to make sure that um, the cattle are clear when we ship. We're beyond just saying we're doing a good job. We in fact are verifying it. And uh, we are a very transparent organization so uh, we, uh, we have no problem with uh, um, exposing the validation systems that we've got in place. Uh, letting people see them because we're pretty proud of them and we're pretty proud of the folks and the cattle that we, uh, that we get a chance to manage. While the protocols BMG has developed are state of the art, the commitment to cattle care, nutrition and well-being they demonstrate is common across the entire beef cattle industry. Producers in every type of operation from cow-calf to the feedlot work closely with animal nutritionists and with their veterinarians to ensure their animals get the highest level of care. I think that we are a very responsible industry and as such I think that uh, the way I look at it and I, I seriously do is that if, uh, if, I am, if my children get sick uh, I want to I wanna get them healthy as soon as I can and um, in the case of antibiotics uh, that provides that opportunity uh, in, in humans and, and in the cattle that we're responsible for. I, I believe that it's actually a, a, a benefit to the consumer uh, that we are allowed to use these products to keep these animals healthy so that they can have and be assured that there's a safe and wholesome product uh, made available on their plate. The ultimate thing we can do to deliver a safe food source to the consumer is to deliver a healthy animal to harvest. And that involves 
preventing them getting sick. It involves adequate nutrition, the correct nutrition, and it involves intervening when they are at risk of getting sick or they are sick. All of those go together and when we do intervene, we have a very big responsibility to make sure we do so correctly. And that goes, circles back again to the veterinarian and the producer sitting down around the kitchen table or in the office and planning that out. Dr. Mike Apley, a Kansas State University veterinary clinical pharmacologist, has a long history of working with cattle producers, conducting research and consulting with companies and production systems as new drugs are evaluated and brought to the market. He notes that many people don't realize the intense effort those working in the beef industry put into the safe and proper use of tools like antibiotics and vaccines that protect and improve animal health. One of the things I'm proudest of about the beef industry is our record system. I would want consumers to know that in our feeding facilities we have individual animal records. We can go back to individual drug applications. We can monitor how those animals turned out, if they had to be treated again, if they did not get well soon. We have records on who was treated, how many were treated, how they turned out, when they got sick. I would challenge the human health profession to come up with the level of records we have. And we use those records to really agonize about what's our selection criteria for giving these animals a drug and what did it do for us. And if we had to give it to quite a few, what can we do next time to prevent that happening? It's a real feedback loop that I'm not sure many people are aware of. I'm a mom and I have little kids and people want to know, um, consumers today are wanting to know more about what happened to their food and where it come from and the people that take care of it. And so that's why we've really, you know, stepped things up and, you know, have all these documented procedures because we're no longer an industry where everything's just based on a handshake. People come out and audit you and evaluate, evaluate us and we're open to that. We, you know, welcome people to come in and look at our operations and talk to our crews and audit our books. Um, we're very proud of what we do. That pride is evident in the passion Heather Donnelly, John Butler, and cattle producers across the country have for daily care of their animals, no matter the weather or the season. It's a commitment to animal welfare, animal health, and food safety that serves as the foundation for their life's work. In Central Kansas, I'm Dave Russell reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Now this is just the first in a four-part series that we're bringing to you. The series is made possible through a grant from Bear Animal Health. For more information, visit cattlemantocattlemen.org. And we'll be right back. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NCBA is the premier cattle industry organization representing your best interests in Washington, D.C. and across the country. I want to have my voice heard, and this is the strongest way I can speak it, is through NCBA. And my little voice gets, gets a lot of magnitude with this group. Well, I've been an NCBA member for a long time. I, my, uh, my family thoroughly believes in giving back to the industry that they make a living from. And, you know, I've carried that on from generation to generation, and this is the organization of choice for the beef industry. Every day, NCBA works to represent you on issues including trade, taxes, food safety and nutrition, animal welfare, and the environment. The main reason I'm an NCBA member is to become engaged and more, and more knowledgeable about everything that's going on in the beef industry. It's easy to join NCBA. Just visit BeefUSA.org or call us at 1-866-USA-BEEF. If you aren't implanting your calves with Ralgro, you're leaving money on the table. Ralgro is tried and true technology that increases average daily gains and improves your utilization of pasture resources. Ralgro can increase weaning weight in steers and heifers by as much as 20 to 35 pounds, which lowers your break-even point and puts more money in your pocket. Don't leave money on the table. Go to www.ralgro.com to learn more. 
Purina's wind and rain minerals are research tested and field proven to provide balanced mineral nutrition essential for cattle health, growth, and reproduction. They're highly palatable so cattle consume what they need when they need it. And wind and rain mineral special formulation resists the elements so they won't blow out of the feeder and maintain their palatability even if they've been wet. Wind and rain cattle minerals from Purina Mills, building better cattle. Discover a great roundup for beef producers. Now, Beringer Ingelheim Vet Medica Incorporated has rounded up the top brands of animal health products. You bet your boots you won't find more ways to protect your cattle. So trust the leader to protect your cattle. Trust Beringer Ingelheim. Talk to your Beringer Ingelheim Animal Health representative and discover how we can help your operation. Quality matters to me because I'm responsible for the care and preserving the health of cattle every day. Healthy cattle are the key to safe and wholesome beef. As a vet, I work hard to look out for the well-being of the cattle, no matter the time of day, no matter the weather. I'm here for the animals, and my work matters when it comes to the safety of the beef Americans eat. I'm proud of what we'll do here today. Those who've been involved in the cattle industry a long time have a deep appreciation for how far we've come in terms of understanding animal health and having access to medications and antibiotics that can prevent or eliminate disease in livestock. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Dave Russell takes a look at the use of antibiotics in the beef industry in the second installment of our four-part series. The reason we use antibiotics is to keep the, the cattle healthy. It's no different than, you know, with your family. If someone's sick, you want them to get better. And that's the reason we do it here. Um, you, and we try to use as, you know, as little as we can to make them healthy. For me, the bottom line is the responsibility that we've got as cattlemen um, to keep the animals as healthy as possible um, and keep them uh, content and, uh, and in, a, in a very healthy environment. And uh, so to accomplish that, just like in, in a human environment, it takes uh, vaccinations uh, to do that, uh, to prevent against sort of a proactive approach to diseases that they may come in contact with. In the case of antibiotics, it, it helps us uh, mitigate against the introduction of pathogens. Um, and that's very important to keep the animal system uh, healthy and, and running right. Keeping cattle healthy is at the top of the list for every cattleman, whether in a feedlot operation, such as the Beef Marketing Group's location in Great Bend, Kansas, or a cow-calf operation out on a ranch. Cattle producers work in tandem with their veterinarians to ensure antibiotics are used judiciously to maintain healthy cattle. I believe antibiotics have a place in sound, judicious beef production. We should use them when they're warranted, use them for as long as they're needed, and then move on. The uses we can have for antibiotics in beef production range from therapy of an animal that we've identified as sick, an individual animal, to control of disease in a group where we have some that are sick and we know others are incubating it and are soon to be sick, or prevention where we know a group is at high risk of getting a disease. So as we go through those different uses, it's very important that we know our targets we know our drug, and we know exactly how to use them. Many feedlot operators use FDA-approved antibiotics in cattle feed as an option to prevent disease and eliminate problems before they get started. In our operation, uh, uh, we, we do uh, feed uh, low-level uh, antibiotics in the feed to get them started up on feed. It helps them from a, a health standpoint, and that's our objective, to mitigate the challenges that they face when they come in contact with other cattle and, and in, an, in a, an environment where the, there is sort of a concentration of animals. And uh, by doing this at a very low level, it helps keep the cattle healthy, and that's what our objective is. So uh, we do it. It's, it's uh, very much under a, um, a managed situation. In that case, uh, we use a, uh, a trained licensed nutritionist 
uh, that actually makes up the, the complete rations that we feed to these cattle. Uh, they're, they're high quality, high uh, product, uh, very high quality of products that are used in the complete ration. And we add vitamins and minerals. And uh, in the case of starting up cattle and getting them uh, right under, under challenge conditions, we will use low level, uh, a low level feed uh, grade uh, antibiotics to, to really help those cattle get off and, and get to a good start. From the beginning, calves are at risk for disease. And as they grow, they can pass those diseases from one to another. Cattlemen use a variety of tools like good nutrition, a strong vaccination program, and the judicious use of antibiotics to mitigate and control health risks. I think that we are a very responsible industry. And as such, um, I think that uh, uh, you know, the way I look at it, and I, I seriously do, is that if uh, if I am if my children get sick, uh, I want to I want to get them healthy as soon as I can. And um, in the case of antibiotics, uh, that provides that opportunity uh, in in humans and and in the cattle that we're responsible for. So I believe that it's actually a benefit to the consumer that we are allowed to use these products to keep these animals healthy so that they can have and be assured that there's a safe and wholesome product uh, made available on their plate. We're going to treat an animal in our care that's sick. In, in the systems I work in and the training I give veterinarians is when we have a sick animal we're going to intervene. Immediately thereafter our goal becomes how do we prevent having to do that again and that goes back to the relationship that's decades old between veterinarians and producers of working together to try to prevent the disease. But when we do have an ill animal or we have a group at risk of disease, we want to be able to intervene. The use of antibiotics to both prevent and treat diseases in cattle is tightly regulated by FDA and guided by veterinarians and strict procedures. It's all based on a wealth of scientific data proving the safety and effectiveness of the products used. It's hard science. It's not only being with the animals, looking at them, being good stewards of the animals, it's relying on science such as this that's a lot of really expensive equipment, highly trained people working with these animals, determining how the drugs work, where they go. And so when we say that we deliver a safe product to the marketplace, it isn't a hollow statement. There's a lot of science like this backing it up. I think here at the Beef Marketing Group, this is going to sound a little uh, selfish, but we go above and beyond when it comes to uh, implementing uh, protocols. But um, the protocols for using uh, products in, in feed or uh, in, in therapeutic use or uh, injectables are very tight and very stringent. Most all beef operations use these products under the guidance of a licensed veterinarian. It's very prescribed, it's very regimented, and it's very well monitored. With oversight from the Food and Drug Administration, the use of antibiotics to protect animal health is closely monitored, from product development and regulatory approval, all the way through to their use by veterinarians and producers on the ranch or at the feedlot. In addition, before beef goes to the consumer, it is rigorously tested for drug residues to prevent any entry into the food supply. All the antibiotics uh, used in beef production are FDA approved. They're approved for uh, food safety, for environmental safety, for safety to the animal, and for effectiveness. It's not like we just throw these things around. The other thing that consumers should really know is that these drugs cost money. And we are at an economic advantage to avoid the use of these, if at all possible, other than the fact that we just don't want to use them because that means that that animal is in a state where it requires them, and we hope to prevent that. We are a very uh, margin-based business. Uh, there's not a lot of flexibility and profitability uh, in the business that we're involved in. So, everything that we uh, that we are in, that we bring into the animals uh, production system is evaluated from a cost-benefit standpoint, and uh, uh, antibiotics, uh, animal health products are not cheap. Uh, they are, they are uh, very costly and, um, and rightly so because they do a good job for us, but uh, we're very careful about the use of it, the management of the inventory, uh, because uh, that, can, that can actually be the difference between uh, breaking even on a set of cattle or losing money. For producers, having a profitable business is based in large part on the careful use of proven science-based strategies and animal health products 
to ensure cattle health, welfare, and beef safety to the benefit of consumers around the world. I'm Dave Russell, reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Comprehensive, practical, powerful. Now's the time to put the power of DNA to work in your herd with the comprehensive Igenity Profile. The inside information from Igenity can help you make more confident replacement heifer and herd sire selection decisions, add marketability to your feeder cattle, make faster genetic progress, and more. The best time to get started is when you're already working cattle during branding, weaning, or bull soundness exams. Get started today. Visit iGenity.com or call 1-877-IGENITY to put the power of DNA to work in your herd. Before you head out here, get ready at Cabela's. Your source for the hottest new gear at tough to beat prices. Save big on everything you need when you shop by catalog, stores, and online at Cabela's.com. Our legendary selection is field tested and field proven. You can trust our gear. Cabela's, world's foremost outfitter. Tough trailers built for tough country. Big Bend Trailers manufactures a different kind of trailer. One that's built to put up with the rough conditions found on the ranch. Rugged built using heavy gauge powder coated steel and a 2x4 rectangle tube frame. There's a 1 inch gap between the side and floor, so there's no place for water or manure to accumulate and rust. Big Bend trailers are loaded with standard features, a lever action hitch, a 3 foot escape gate, and a middle sorting gate, rhino lining along the front edges, and a receiver hitch to tow another trailer, chute, or other equipment. Tough and practical, that's Big Bend trailers, designed and built by a working cattleman you can rely on and trust Big Ben trailers for their durability and convenient features. Reasonably priced for any rancher to afford. For a list of dealers and other design features, visit BigBenTrailers.com. Big Ben Trailers, built cattlemen tough. You know, I didn't think I could afford to vaccinate for scours. Then my vet told me about Guardian vaccine. Guardian offers the most complete coverage of any Skyers vaccine. And now Guardian can protect my calves against E. coli up to six months prior to calving. It pays to vaccinate with Guardian Skyers vaccine. Thanks to Guardian, I have healthier calves and healthier profits. Antibiotics are a tool used to care for and maintain cattle health. They are backed up by a stringent regulatory system and a strong scientific foundation. We continue our series of reports now with a look at the government's role in approving and monitoring the use of animal antibiotics in the United States. Cattleman the Cattleman reporter Dave Russell reports. It's well known that in the cattle industry, producers work with their veterinarians to develop a holistic herd health program that helps their cattle maintain or regain superior health. Antibiotics are one of the many tools cattlemen use judiciously because they are effective in fighting pathogens that can cause illness in cattle. What is not so well known is the rigorous testing and approval process that must be adhered to before an antibiotic can be used in the beef cattle industry. Within the Center of Veterinary Medicine, our main role is to do the evaluation of drug products that are going to be used in animals to ensure both their safety and effectiveness, and from that to protect animal health as well as human health. And we also take a look at any of the devices that will be used in animals as well. And this overview is one that has brought together a number of offices within our center and a talent pool that is similar to being in a university. We have absolutely the best minds here to do so many different reviews on the topics that we address. Dr. Bernadette Dunham is a veterinarian and she leads the U.S. Food and Drug Administration Center for Veterinary Medicine. Her team at FDA manages the stringent scientific approval and monitoring process for the use of antibiotics at livestock and they are responsible for regulating animal feed, including pet food. You're looking at pharmacologists, our physiologists, molecular biologists, biochemists, statisticians, all of these 
experts are involved in the review of any single application that comes through CVM. And it's this team tagging with this detailed background of scientific rigor that allows us to be sure when we finally have an approval, it's meant, met a very high standard for the science in order to assure the safety and effectiveness of that product. The FDA review process includes testing all new animal drugs for safety and effectiveness in the animal for sound and sterile manufacturing processes and in the case of food animals such as beef cattle to ensure food safety. We also take a look at making sure that if there's going to be any residues of those products, they have to be reviewed by our Division of Animal Food Safety and we also have to ensure that there is a residue test. So the company has to provide us with any of these tests and we go through the analysis to ensure they work so that if this product is going to be used, we ensure by the time it becomes a food item, there's no residues that could impact human health. So the scrutiny is not only to ensure the drug is safe and effective and does what it's supposed to do in the animal, but moreover, that anything that's going to come from that animal as a food product is going to be safe for human consumption. Once a drug has FDA approval and is being used in the marketplace, the FDA's Office of Surveillance and Compliance monitors and gathers reports on the drug's use on an ongoing basis to ensure it remains safe and effective. Beyond FDA's testing and monitoring process, the USDA's Food Safety and Inspection Service also plays an essential role with regard to residue testing. FSIS, uh, our core mission, which we really got in this business back in 1906, our core mission is inspection. Inspection of livestock, carcass by carcass inspection in livestock. We look at every animal before slaughter. We make sure they're handled in a humane manner. We look at every carcass after slaughter. And then as they get fabricated throughout the food chain into either raw or, or, uh, or ready meat products, then we look at the various parts of those uh, processes. For FSIS, the primary focus in terms of antibiotics is to ensure there are no residues present in the meat. We're confident saying the national domestic food supply as far as a residue perspective is quite safe. It's not perfect, but it's quite safe. The other uh, antibiotic screening that we do is really focused on the implant arena. This is where my inspectors or veterinarians have a particular animal come through and we'll talk about cattle for example. If they have a, uh, an animal come through with a particular disease and they think that animal was likely to have been treated recently with antibiotics, they're going to check that animal for antibiotic residues. Or if they have an animal that comes through and they see an injection lesion somewhere in the body, they're going to check that animal for antibiotic residues. And we do uh, about 130,000 of those tests per year. So we do a lot of surveillance. Another key piece of the puzzle in regulating the use of antibiotics in animal agriculture is a program called NARMS, the National Antibiotic Residue Monitoring System, which was launched in 1996. NARMS is a team effort between USDA, the Centers for Disease Control, and FDA. So together what we wanted to look at was a, an integrated and a comprehensive program to try to tackle what might be happening with the antimicrobial resistance from essentially farm to fork and to, to consumer and, 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 and look at one of the main goals is to look at what impact antimicrobial use in animal agriculture has on human health and by no means is that an easy question to tackle. That's something that we've been working on for a long time now. Cattle producers and their veterinarians take great care to use antibiotics judiciously. By law, they are required to follow the FDA-approved labels and are committed to the Beef Quality Assurance Producer Guidelines for judicious use of antimicrobials. They also support the NARMS program, which provides an early warning system to detect any change in pathogen resistance patterns. Sometimes people talk about controlling antimicrobial resistance, and, and that's fine. We should always strive to have uh, the most judicious antimicrobial use policy available so that we don't develop resistant bacteria. But what's really important is also to remember that we have to have management systems and we have to have processes in place that enables us to reduce pathogen level regardless of whether they're resistant bacteria or not because they could still make us ill. And the whole goal, the whole goal of, of the Agricultural Research Service, particularly the food safety component, 
is to provide a, a safe and healthy food supply, a wholesome food supply for the U.S. So, so this is really what we're looking toward. Clearly, for regulators and for cattlemen, healthy cattle are the foundation of a safe and wholesome food supply. It's also clear that the science behind antibiotics approved and used in the cattle industry can give consumers and cattlemen a high level of confidence in the way beef is produced. Cattlemen are very conscientious about digging into the science. They're very curious about the science. As a matter of fact, uh, I still go to some feed yards and one of them I go work with. A big part of our day is sitting down around a table with the crew and the manager and what's new. And they're the happiest with a change in production when we've got science, when I can bring papers, when I can bring presentations and say this is what they found out and this is the reason we're going to do this. That's how cattlemen approach things. I'm Dave Russell reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. There's a lot of science and information to take in when it comes to how the cattle industry uses tools like antibiotics, but there are threats that could prevent veterinarians and cattlemen from using antibiotics to prevent disease and keep cattle healthy. We'll have more on that coming up later in the show. We'll be right back. I'd like a moment with you dairy men, and if you're watching this, I'll assume you're done milking, to talk about the Dairy Beef Quality Assurance Program. DBQA has been designed to reduce lameness, bruises, and impolite behavior in the dairy cows and calves and steers that you're going to market for beef. The point is to guarantee as best we can to your buyers and to the consumer that we know what we're doing, that we're treating our animals right and that the meat they buy is safe and wholesome. Because every milk cow and dairy calf you sell is gonna wind up on a plate someday, and we wanna make sure that our consumers have a great dining experience, right? Dairy BQA helps furnish you with management tools and useful information to increase the value of the cattle you market. So I invite y'all to check it out at dbqa.org. See what it takes to be involved in your state. Because that's the right thing to do. Your feedlot is a pack on the pounds enterprise where your goal is to get the animals to market fast. Every minute counts as you battle the weather, livestock genetics, and health issues. Now there's a powerful new dual action therapy for the hospital pen that shares your need for fast action. Rest Floor Gold. Ask your veterinarian about Rest Floor Gold. See improvement in as few as six hours with Rest Floor Gold. You like the John Deere 568 round banner for everything it has. Now, you like it even more for what it doesn't. Get rid of the twine tie system and run a 568 with nothing but net. That's right, nothing but easy loading, fast wrapping, bail protecting, cover edge net wrap. Put one to work in your field. See your John Deere dealer today. Many cattle producers know there are currently legislative efforts that would sharply limit or even prohibit the use of antibiotics in animal agriculture. We wrap up our series of reports with a look at the current legislative environment of antibiotics used in the livestock industry. Dave Russell reports. For decades, cattle producers have been using a variety of tools like antibiotics to prevent and treat disease in their herds. Now on Capitol Hill, legislation has been introduced that would sharply limit the use of these tools within all of animal agriculture. My biggest concern is legislation that circumvents the regulatory process. We have a regulatory process that served us well for many years and has evaluated these drugs for safety. The regulatory process is there to address all these issues, but when we have groups that are trying to circumvent that system, and proceed on a legislative agenda, then I'm very concerned that we're not relying as much on science as we are on emotion and politics. In Congress, a bill called PAMTA, the Preservation for Antibiotic Medical Treatment Act, has been introduced by New York Democratic Congresswoman Louise Slaughter, who chairs the House Rules Committee and is a microbiologist. Last year, her committee held a hearing on the bill, 
where Leonard Boswell, a Democratic congressman from Iowa, testified. Uh, Louise Slaughter holding hearings in the Rules Committee about animal antibiotics. That's unprecedented. I would argue she has zero jurisdiction. And someone made the point that uh, even though she uh, has uh, pointed out that she, she is uh, a microbiologist, that she last studied microbiology when Harry Truman was president. I think Chris Sauter, from wherever her perspective is, she's coming with a concern, you know, and I, you, can, you, can, you can tell about her background. But we heard that she was gonna have this hearing, which was kind of unorthodox. We didn't, we don't have the rules committee. I, I've no, known of them having hearings on something of this nature. And Alexis on my staff have heard about it, and so we talked about it, so we thought, well, we better participate if we can. So we made the effort and did. I guess we were the only dissenting individual there on that uh, program that day. But uh, so we got into quite a discussion and uh, you know, that kind of started what's going on here today. Congressman Boswell is a cattleman himself and he's concerned about the impact the PAMTA bill would have on the U.S. livestock industry. This would cause uh, us in the animal production industry to some of the usages we have with different antibiotics to have to go back and reprove they're okay, which has been through an already an extensive program, very extensive with FDA. Very, a lot of time and a lot of investment and for a good reason, because we want to have safe food. I don't want to eat unsafe food. I don't want my family or my grandchildren or anybody else's. And that's my perspective that, I think that's the perspective of all the producers. We wouldn't want that. So we've been pleased we've gone through this and there's a number of, of products there that uh, this could possibly take away. This legislation, as I understand it, essentially bans the use of non-therapeutic antibiotics and uh, they're described as growth hormones. Well, we know that it, the gains come from diminishing the amount, of, the amount of diseases that animals get. So it's preventative for diseases. And we've done it for a long time like that. There is no evidence that antibiotics are building up in people which causes a resistance to human antibiotics, but there is a religion of suspicion that that's the case. And it grew in Europe, in Europe, Denmark banned the use of antibiotics in agriculture more than a decade ago, which mostly affected pork producers there. Members of the House Agriculture Committee traveled to Denmark last September to get a first-hand look at the results. So we went over and talked to their science community, their education community, and went out and talked to some farmers. And uh, I don't know if we came back with anything very conclusive, but I, I think I can say this from reading between the lines and hearing their answers that actually their uh, death loss went up. Uh, they drove a lot of farmers out of business. They went from like 20 some thousand farmers down to like what 5,000, something like that. The days to, to weaning and so on is longer and they created more expense. And what the result of it is, is they lost some producers when they first passed the legislation. And those that were willing, able to adapt, um, watched as they, they had uh, more of the pigs uh, prior to weaning especially that they lost or during the weaning period when there's high stress period of time. And uh, today it takes the Danes about four and a half more days to get a hog to market than it does uh, us in the United States. I think those kind of numbers would extrapolate over to the beef industry. And uh, I believe also what happened in Denmark and has happened in many places in Europe is the, uh, the people who have this suspicion or religion that the use of antibiotics in animals translates into resistance to um, the antibiotics in humans. Uh, these, these people have pushed this politically in Europe and in doing so, I think the Danish livestock producers along with many European producers pushed back lost the political debate. Now the easy is the point of the path of least resistance for them now is to push on America and say, well, you adopt our policy. Uh, that were, therefore the Danes and other Europeans could compete better with the United States because they would uh, take away some of the tools that we have that make us more competitive. We think in the final analysis, um, what they ended up doing is greatly disrupting their industry at very little benefit. Um, they may have shown some reduction in resistant bacteria in animals and some food products, but they really did not prove that they benefited human health. And to this day, there's no solid evidence that human health has, in fact, been, been improved because of this ban. So we think it was a very costly move on their part and uh, not sure what they really accomplished. They, they try to say that, well, we accomplished the goal of reducing antibiotic use. And they may have done that. 
overall. But certainly after the ban took place, the therapeutic antibiotic use went way up because they were having to treat diseases they weren't treating before. So it's very debatable whether the Denmark experiment, if you will, and the European experiment has really done, done much other than disrupt animal agriculture, maybe led to increased food costs, and, um, and not really helped human health. Those pushing the PAMTA bill say the use of antibiotics in animal agriculture develops resistant bacteria in humans and reduces the effectiveness of human antibiotics. But with FDA and USDA approving, regulating, and monitoring these products, the science shows antibiotic resistance is a complex issue where both risks and benefits need to be considered. And the impact of losing antibiotics in animal agriculture would be devastating to animal health, welfare, and food security. Certainly, disease is going to go up. Uh, certainly uh, producers are going to suffer and it's likely it's going to have an impact on food costs as well. So uh, we don't support PAMTA. We think that uh, the FDA ought to be allowed to do what they do best and that is, to, is that is to look at a scientific process. They have been reviewing these products for a long time. They have yet to find a significant public health problem with them. Uh, this would tend to force that issue. We don't think it's necessary to force that issue because FDA has been, has been doing the job for a while and if they find there's a problem, I'm sure our companies will, will work with them to try to determine that there is a problem. But um, PAMTA is, um, is very um, overreaching, we think. Now this don't make much sense to force something that doesn't need to happen. Do we have a good protective? Do we have a good check and balance? We do. And so I think we'll need to recognize that. So we're going to watch it very closely. And uh, I don't think that there's any other committee that would have any more interest or more concern than the Agriculture Committee. And so if this starts moving along, uh, we'll certainly ask for it to be referred to the Ag Committee for action. And uh, I can't imagine when I will do all I can to the leadership to say, you know, this has a major impact on food production and this world population increasing by not over 90 million a year. This is not the time for us to do silly things, it's not necessary. Well, I represent the number one pork producing district in America and we have a lot of beef cattle also in the district and stock cows as well. Uh, there isn't anybody in the ag industry that thinks it's a good idea to let the inner city of America tell us what we can do. And there isn't any sound science for them to base that on. So all of these arguments get made. Uh, if you want to argue on sound science, we win. If livestock producers win, uh, they can use non-therapeutic antibiotics without any real scientific evidence of a problem. Um, if you want to argue the economics, that argument is also strong. We need to get our livestock to market, and the, the more quickly and safely and effectively we can do that, the better we can compete in the larger market share of the overall protein market we're going to have. So I think the future of the livestock industry, the future of American competitiveness, all, all hangs out there in the balance, and it's under assault. The bottom line message is that we think the bill is founded on the premise that production agriculture is a problem. And I think the message to our producers out there is, you know, we produce the safest and most wholesome food in the world. And this could, could seriously undermine that. And we think that to take good technologies, safe technologies, out of the producers' hands uh, that have not been proven to be a safety hazard to, uh, to public health is, is really ill-advised. And we would suggest the producers you know, try to fight this at all costs because it, it simply is not appropriate uh, to take an action that's not based on, on risk um, just because there's a perception that there's a problem. It's not the way we do things in the United States. It may be the way they've done things in Europe, but we still try to stand behind the scientific process. Those who know Capitol Hill say this is a battle that will continue. And NCBA and its membership will have to weigh in and stay engaged on Capitol Hill to preserve the opportunity to have the animal health care tools America's livestock producers need. I'm Dave Russell, reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Now, the PAMTA legislation and the issue of antibiotic use in animal agriculture is something we will continue to follow here on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll be right back. Draxon. 
clearly Cattlemen's number one choice to fight BRD. Here's why. Nothing is more depressing in a stalker business as the doctor and doctor. And you still have your chronics, you still have your death loss. Man, with Drax, we just found out, that, especially with microplasts, you just had to be there to see the results. And the evidence backs up what most cattlemen already know. Draxon cuts chronics and mortalities by 70%. So talk to your veterinarian and check the online calculator at Draxon.com. You'll see. Nothing gives you more for your money when you're fighting BRD. Just a great antibiotic. Very, very effective. Don't let the price tag scare you. It's a no-brainer. You just use it. Do not use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older. Do not use in calves to be processed for veal. Draxon has a pre-slaughter withdrawal time of 18 days. Please visit Draxon.com or call 1-888-DRAXON for more information. You take pride in the beef you raise. Countless hours invested to assure a safe and wholesome calf crop. Why trust that calf crop to just anyone? Experience the new Dinklage difference with a long history and reputation for outstanding performance and cattle care. We use a combination of cutting edge technologies and data driven decision making to establish our place as leaders in the cattle feeding industry. Allow Dinklage to be a part of your team in the quest to maximize your profits with five locations to serve you in Wyoming, Nebraska, and Colorado. For more information on the new Dinklage difference, stop by one of our yards or visit us on the web at DinklageFeedYards.com. Two 100% pure USDA inspected patties are only the beginning of what make the Big Mac famous, and that's what we're made of. Seventy percent of consumers want to know where their food comes from and how can we ignore them? IMI Global offers third-party audited source and age verification essential for export markets and specialty markets like natural, organic, omnivorous, Eskimo, or possibly recovering vegan certified. For quality and age producers, to the big boys, any cattleman who wants to expand his market, you're not just buying this green ear tag, you're buying peace of mind. IMIGlobal.com why is B&W's Turnover Ball the best-selling gooseneck hitch in the country? Maybe it's the ingenious way it solves everyday problems. Or because it's time-tested and is rated to tow 30,000 pounds. Maybe it's because our lifetime warranty gives hard-working people peace of mind. Or maybe it's because folks love to own a hitch that's still 100% made in America. The Turnover Ball by B&W. Trusted. So, Jack, you think you'd like this bull? Oh, man, I'd like this bull. Got a little Holstein in him, you yeah. can see. Well, I'll make him get it in a minute. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're happy to. <laughs> At bull sales, we go to great lengths to pick the kind of bulls that'll fit our own cows. We study the program for EPDs, ADGs, CEDs, DOBs, RFIs, BWs, and WBBQs. WBBQ is when's the barbecue start? Well, it's possible to estimate such things as yearling ribeye area per hundredweight, or residual feed intake, the animal's disposition, and of course the body weight of the auctioneer. If our wives had picked their husbands with the care we buy a bull, there'd be a lot more bachelors on the street. We'd be bucked up in the willers with the other mossy horns, just waiting for a straggler still in heat. They would check us all as yearlings on the lookout for bad eyes and notice how we traveled in the rocks. But thank goodness we weren't cattle, because a lot of us sneaked by nearsighted, deaf, and showing sickle hawks. If they'd marched us through the sail ring as she sat there in the crowd and studied us and read our pedigree, could she see we might get paunchy? And the highest grade we got in heifer satisfaction was a C. Would it make her any difference if she knew we'd lose our teeth and slough our hair and let our toes grow long? Would her herd sire valuation be affected by the fact when we were born, they used to come along? And our famed yearling libido, she'd observed when we were young, cracking horns and tearing up the ground, now occurred about as often as a paid bank holiday. Could she know then we'd all wind up unsound? 
Of course, we tell ourselves she's lucky to have had a private bull for all these years through all the ups and downs. But down deep, each cowman's thankful that he curled his lip just right before he had more time to shop around. This is Baxter Blunt and friends from out there. Welcome back. It's amazing to see where we receive different farm and family photos from each week. Let's check out this week's legacy photos. Now keep sending us those photos. To do so, visit our website at cattlemantocattlemen.org. Thanks for joining us on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll look forward to seeing you right back here next week on RFD-TV.